let me start out by talking about one of the smallest countries in the world. It's approximately four and a half thousand square miles. If you look at the lower peninsula of the state of Michigan, it's 40,000 square miles. So it's one-tenth the size of the lower peninsula. I, I'm giving you scale here. So the name of it is Lebanon. And in fact, uh, most of us know people uh, here in the United States who refer to themselves by their origin as Lebanese. Uh, in fact, the largest contingent of Arabs living in Dearborn come from, uh, come from Lebanon, not from Iraq, but I'm talking about Dearborn, come from Lebanon. But it's, it's, a, it's a tiny country. So now it's a country that's about half the size of Israel. It has a population of about somewhere between three and a half million to four million. They never take a census, and I will explain why in a short while. Uh, but it's estimated there's somewhere between three and a half million to four million people in this place. Now, although people have lived there in civilization for thousands of years, the country is very new. Lebanon did not exist as a country before 1926. In fact, the word Lebanese was not used before 1926. People who came from the area, and I remember it as a child, were generally referred to as Syrians. That was the word. The word Lebanese didn't uh, achieve currency, actually, until after World War II. It, not only is it small, uh, it is new. It was created by the French who had occupied Syria in order to create a regime that would be friendly to them. Um, one of the minorities in Syria were the Christians. The majority were overwhelmingly Muslim. The French were looking for collaborators. The Christians obviously saw protectors in the French. The French also were, were Christian. So uh, it would be as though we would create a black state by carving out Detroit, do you understand, and making it a separate state, the state of Detroit. Uh, and now that would have a majority of black people in it. Now there was a little corner of Syria along the coast in the Lebanon mountains that had a majority, a bare majority, not a large majority, a slim majority of Christian people. And so in 1926, the French separated this territory from Syria, just separated it, arbitrarily drew the boundaries without talking, of course, to the people in the area. Why should they? Um, and created a new country. And that country became the first Arabic-speaking country with a Christian majority, artificially created by the French, just north of Palestine, right? just north of British Palestine. French Syria was now divided into two two colonies. The big one was called Syria, and the small one was called Lebanon. Syria was the big one. Lebanon is so small it's hard to see it on the map, just like, uh, just like Israel, especially if you're looking at a map of, of Asia. And uh, this colony uh, went through World War II. In World War II, the French changed sides. Do you remember? They were on the side of the British. And then in June of 1940, there came this wonderful guy called Maréchal Pétain, and he decided that Hitler was better for France than uh, the other side. So uh, France switched sides. 
And in fact, when the French switched sides, that meant that Lebanon went over to the Nazi side, because the French were on that side. The British in Palestine could not endure it. So they took their army, including Jewish volunteers. One of them was Moshe Dayan. And they invaded Lebanon and Syria and took them, because they couldn't leave them under the control of the Vichy French. Nazis might arrive from Germany. So they took very scarce soldiers, and it was in that battle that Moshe Dayan lost his eye, in case you're interested in historical details. We always know the what? The famous eye patch. It was in that battle that he lost his eye. And now Lebanon is occupied by the British. Well, the British can't hang on to it. So in 1946, after the war, Lebanon simply becomes independent. And Syria become independent. And after 20 years of being a colony, Lebanon turns into an independent country. It's not that old. It's only two years older as an independent state than the state of Israel. So it's new. Just as the word Israeli, nobody used the word Israeli before 1948, did they? Uh, just as the word Israeli uh, was new, the word Lebanese now became new. Uh, established in 1946, uh, from the beginning of its establishment, it confronted challenges. So let me just mention them. Uh, the first was, no sooner do they become independent, then hordes of Palestinian refugees are pouring across their border because south of them is Palestine. In Palestine, there's a civil war between the Jews and the Arabs, and the next thing you know is the Jews have taken two-thirds of Palestine, established a state called Israel, and now there are thousands and thousands and thousands of Palestinian refugees. Where are they going to go? The Riviera. No, they, they, just, they, they flee across the, the border, and now they pour into Lebanon. Most of them are Muslim. So already you can see the problem. A slight increase in the Muslim population would mean that the state would cease to have a majority of Christians and now would have a majority of Muslims and all these Muslims are pouring into uh, the state of Lebanon and putting up their tents and establishing their refugee camps. The second challenge, of course, was the emergence on its southern border of a state that wasn't an Arab state. The state of Israel with a fairly powerful army and Lebanon didn't have much of an army. They mainly were engaged in banking and trade and commerce. So that was pretty uh, iffy. Uh, in fact, the Lebanese were quite worried about that. And then the third challenge was in 1952 and 53, there arose in Egypt a man called Nasser who said he wanted to unify all the Arab states into one great Arab country. And uh, Nasser represented a people that was overwhelmingly Muslim. This was a Christian, Arabic-speaking state. When I say Christian, I mean it used to be itsy bitsy majority. Uh, Lebanon was a Christian state in the way that Israel was a, a Jewish state, but it just, just a little bit. Uh, and so Nasser persuades the Syrians to join him in a union, which brings Nasser all the way to the borders of Lebanon. In fact, they develop a name for it. They call it the United Arab Republic which included Egypt and Syria, and then Nasser hoped that all the other Arab states would join the, the Union. So now on her border is a militant Arab nationalist movement controlled by Muslims, not by Christians. And then in 1967 
came the Six-Day War. And Israel triples its territory. It takes the West Bank and Gaza and the Sinai Peninsula and reaches the Suez Canal. So with that kind of military victory, and given the fact that Lebanon has almost no army of significance, it would be an easy catch for Israel just to cross the border into Lebanon and take it. So the, the, again, these are, these are scary times. It's not easy to be a small country. I mean, it's, it's easy if you're in the middle of the Pacific, like Tonga. Do you understand? I mean, you, you're surrounded by thousands and thousands and thousands of miles of uh, the Pacific Ocean, so that's fine. Uh, but uh, if you're in the Middle East, in this place, uh, it was certainly challenging. And then, in the early 1960s, it became very clear. The Christians were more prosperous than the Muslims. So their birth rate was lower, right? The more money, the more wealth, the fewer babies. If you want a lot of grandchildren, stay poor. I mean, that's the way to get grandchildren. Stay poor. Whenever they offer you money, turn it away. Avoid it under all circumstances. Because money and wealth suppresses the birth rate. People find other things to do with their time. So, uh, so the, by the beginning of the 1960s, it was clear that the Christians were a minority. So they stopped taking the census. They're still using a census that goes back 50 years. Because in that census, the Christians are a, <laughs> are a majority. The, the great fear on the Christian part was if you take the census, it will be very clear that they are a minority and they are a declining minority. Uh, because in addition to a low birth rate, there has been heavy emigration. The first uh, Arabic-speaking people to come to this area were Christians. Uh, they were people of trade and commerce, and they came here. So the first Arabic-speaking people to come to the Detroit area go back to the end of the 19th century. We now call them the Lebanese, but then they were called the, the Syrians, and they came and they did business. And now they generally live on the east side and in Gross Point and whatever else it is. I mean, they were the first group to arrive. So, so now you got immigrants. So now this slice of territory that the French had artificially created is losing the purpose for which it was created because you can only sustain it if there is a Christian majority, a clear Christian majority. And then in 1970, Yasser Arafat has shown up and he's created an army called the PLO and he initially stations it in Jordan, which is south of Syria and to the east of Israel. But King Hussein of Jordan doesn't want Arafat in his country, causing trouble. So in 1970, he expels the PLO. Where are they going to? To go. Well, Arafat doesn't want to be uh, in the Pacific. He wants his army to be right near Israel. So he moves the PLO from Jordan into Lebanon. And the Lebanese army is so weak that they cannot prevent it. The PLO moves into Lebanon. And Arafat now makes Lebanon his headquarters. If that's not enough, the presence of the Palestinians mobilizes the Muslims. The Muslims are saying, this is not a Christian state, this is a what? A Muslim state. We have the majority. And Arafat says, you certainly do, and I'm going to give you an army. The PLO. And we're going to give it to the Christians. So, good. so out of that, in 1975, begins a civil war that goes on for 15 years. And you may remember the pictures in the newspaper, which will result in the almost total 
devastation of the country. Beirut, which was one of the most beautiful cities in the Middle East. When I first went there in 1971, I just thought it was the most beautiful city I had ever seen in the Middle East. Undoubtedly. It was devastated, destroyed, gone, finished. Downtown looked worse than, you know, the buildings in downtown Detroit. I mean, it was, it was devastated. Bombed out. That civil war went on for 15 years. And what happened during the Civil War was that in order to establish law and order, so they said, the Syrians who had been angry that the French had taken away Lebanon now send their soldiers into Lebanon starting in 1976. And they stay there. In fact, by 1990, after a 14-year period, they establish firm control over the country. So Lebanon is theoretically independent, except it's what? Not independent because the Syrians have taken it and occupied it. They, they've taken it back. The French took it away. And now they've taken it back. If you want to get anything done in Lebanon of any serious nature, you have to go to Damascus, the capital of Syria, because that's where the decisions are made. And from 1990 until 2005, that's the way it was. Syria, a militantly anti-American country was in control of Lebanon. And then it happened, because it happened this year. It was one of the great surprises. A resistance movement arose in Lebanon against the Syrian occupation. It ironically was not led by a Christian. You would imagine they would be the, right, the leaders. It was led by a Muslim, a multi-millionaire Muslim, who was into real estate and construction. His name, Rafi Hariri. And uh, his movement was given force when the Syrian government forced the Lebanese parliament to choose a president they wanted to stay in power. His name was Emil Lahoud, and ironically, he was a Christian who collaborated with the Syrians and was much hated by many of the Christians. Now, in March, you may remember, Rafi Hariri, the multi-millionaire construction man who wanted to oust the Syrians and to become the prime minister of Lebanon was blown up, blown up, obviously, by guess who? Yeah, you don't have to, like, stretch your imagination. All right. By the Syrians and their agents. And what that triggered was something very interesting. It's as though what happened in the Ukraine moved to, the, to Lebanon. All of a sudden, wearing orange, just as in the Ukraine, thousands, hundreds of thousands of people, Christian and Muslim, pour into the streets of Beirut in a massive demonstration demanding that the Syrians leave Lebanon. The television cameras are worrying, do you understand? The whole thing. Well, that demonstration has resulted in changes in Lebanon and ultimately in the Middle East of great significance. And I want to talk about them this morning.
I mean, this, this is a major, it's not a minor, it's a major development. Uh, large numbers of people demonstrating in the Arab world for democratic elections and the ousting of occupiers. All right. So, in order to tell my story, I have to give you some background with regard to Lebanon, because Lebanon was created as a country in 1926, but it had existed for thousands of years before under various names. I mean, it's an old, 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 old civilization. First, let me start out with a place. The place is called Greater Syria. Um, for most of human history, uh, this area wasn't known as Syria, Lebanon, Jordan, Israel. Uh, to most foreigners, the area between Egypt and Iraq, or Mesopotamia, was simply called Syria. Got it? It's a unity. And in fact, uh, the culture of the place has historically been fairly uniform. And whatever language was spoken in the place was spoken with the same uniformity. There wasn't a northern dialect, a southern dialect, an eastern dialect, a western, but there was the Syrian dialect. So Syria, greater Syria historically, included what today is Syria, what today is Lebanon, Jordan, Israel, and Palestine. All of that put them together, and you get what is called Greater Syria. Two, into this place, starting some 5,500 years ago, there came a people who were to dominate Syria. They came out of the Arabian Desert to the south. They are called Semites and they came in various waves. First came a group of people called the Akkadians, and then came a people called the Canaanites, and then after the Canaanites came the Amorites, and after the Amorites came the Hebrews. They, all just, they just invaded the area. They mixed with each other, and they settled down often in the same places next, uh, next to each other. The first great civilization to emerge uh, in greater Syria that we know of is very famous, and the center of it is what is called Lebanon today. The ancient name of Lebanon, the, that, that territory, was Phoenicia. That's where the Phoenicians lived. And most of the great cities of Lebanon today were established thousands of years ago by the Phoenicians. The Phoenicians had four great cities. They were a people of trade and commerce. They faced the Mediterranean Sea. And they went out and for a while they controlled the Mediterranean Sea and established their colonies as far as the Straits of Gibraltar. The language they spoke is Canaanite, which was identical with the language spoken by the Hebrews. So Hebrew and Phoenician are one and the same, and the four great cities are starting in the south and going north. First one is Tyre, T-Y-R-E, very famous. The second one is Sidon, S-I-D-O-N. The third one is Beirut, B-E-I-R-U-T. And the one north of it is Byblos, where the alphabet was invented. In fact, Byblos has given us the name Bible. Uh, and also from Byblos came the first alphabet, the first alphabet, which is the foundation of the Roman alphabet we use to write English, is Phoenician, Canaanite. So this isn't small potatoes, you understand? This most likely in its day was one of the richest countries in the world. Small but rich. Lebanese often pride themselves on being descended, so they claim, 
on being descended from the Phoenicians. All right. They don't speak Phoenician anymore. They don't speak Canaanite anymore. But there it was. And what is very important, and this is the continuity, the major activity of the Phoenicians was not agriculture. It was trade and commerce, and in fact, that has remained historically the major activity of, of Lebanon. To the west uh, of Lebanon, or I say to the east of Lebanon, another people arrived in the area. They're called the Arameans, and they also ultimately turned to trade. Their chief city was a city called Damascus. Uh, they faced the desert and Mesopotamia. Uh, they handled the trade routes from Arabia and the trade routes to Mesopotamia, and they became very rich, uh, also in trade and commerce. In fact, their language, Aramaic, became the chief commercial language of the Middle East. And after a while, all the people of Syria spoke Aramaic including the Jews who lived there. Uh, Judea gave up Hebrew and everybody gave up whatever they were speaking, including the Phoenicians, and began to speak Aramaic. So Aramaic was often called Syrian. It was the language of, uh, of Syria, and the main focus of Syria was trade and commerce which is part of the story of, uh, of Lebanon. Now, Syria never developed its own military power. It lay between Egypt and Assyria or Babylonia. It was always being conquered. It was hard for the Syrians to remain independent. So first came the Assyrians, and then came the Chaldeans, and then came the Persians, and then came the Greeks, and then came the Romans. Each invader left people of their own. So the gene pool in Syria, do you understand, over these thousands of years, is very mixed. You will see blonde people, you will see what? Very dark people, you will see people with narrow skulls, you will see people with wide skulls. Whatever else it is, it's all the inheritance of these continuous invasions going on century after century after century. It was a very valuable piece of land. Now, during the Roman period, a religion came to this place. It's called Christianity. In fact, Christianity began in Greater Syria. Judea is part of Greater Syria. The language that Jesus spoke was what? Aramaic, which is the language of, uh, of Syria. And this religion found its first adherence in Greater Syria. St. Paul, as you may remember, he went on his road to where? To Damascus. So, uh, so there were thousands and thousands of converts, and by the fourth century A.D., the overwhelming majority of the people of this territory were Christian. They were just Christian. But, as you know from the history of religion, uh, no sooner do you establish one church than there's a group of people who don't want to belong. So they go out and found a what? Another one. So the established religion of Syria was called Orthodox Catholic Apostolic Christianity. That was the official Christianity uh, identified and sanctioned by the Roman emperor. But many people in Syria didn't like the Romans. They didn't even like the Greeks. So they invented alternative Christianities, two in particular. One had a fancy Greek name called Monophysite, but that's not important for us to know. The second one is important, it has a name, if you ask most Lebanese Christians to pronounce it, they can't. Monophylite. And uh, the Monophylites 
had an argument with the Roman church about some very abstract piece of theology. Their main reason for rebelling against Roman authority, Roman Christian authority, was that they were Syrians and the Romans were what? Romans, and they weren't treated as equals in the church. And they didn't like it. So they organized their own little Syrian branch of Christianity. And when they got persecuted for doing it, they did something that's very important, which is the beginning of modern Lebanon. Lebanon is the place in greater Syria where the mountains are most congested. There are two ranges of mountains that go down the coast. The one closest to the sea is called the Lebanon Mountains, and then there's a valley between, and then on the other side are what's called the anti-Lebanon Mountains. So when you're being persecuted, what you often do is you run into the mountains. So, this group of heretics who had a name, they were named after their founder. Their founder was uh, St. John Maron, M-A-R-O-N. So they were called the Maronites, and they ran up into the mountains to hide, and in fact, the Romans left them there. They weren't going to follow. Too exhausting, they didn't care. So the mountains now became a refuge. That's very interesting. A refuge for any group that was having a problem with the established government. And the first group to arrive in the mountains uh, were the Maronites. And they were Christians. They are still there. And they're a very important part of what we call modern Lebanon. Now, no sooner did Christianity get established than another group of people arrived, coming from the south. They were called the Arabs. The Arabs didn't speak Aramaic, they spoke Arabic. And their religion wasn't Christianity, their religion was Islam. They now invade the area, and whammo, 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 they conquer it. And now, this territory that we now call Lebanon, all of Syria falls under Muslim control. Uh, this is a very interesting period because the Muslims don't stay united. Very early in the story of Islam, a new sect arises called Shiites. Remember Shiites? We hear a lot about Shiites today. They're certainly not the establishment. The establishment is called Sunni. The Shiites were regarded as heretics and they were persecuted. So what were they going to do? They ran up into the mountains. So now you got a Maronite village here, and you got a what? You got a Shiite village over here. Do they get along? Well, they, they're both being persecuted, so they managed to what? They managed to get together in, in the mountains. And the mountains, by the way, create division. So it's hard to get from one village in one valley to another village in another. So they're all, they're all running up there. And then there arrives a, a third group in the mountains. They're very interesting. Um, the Shiites took over Egypt in the 10th century. And they had a king whose name was Al-Hakim who one day, it happens, thought he was God. See, now you call it the psychiatrist. No, no, no. No, no, no. He, no he, he thought he was, he was God. And there were many people who also thought he was. Uh, he is ultimately assassinated, because obviously some people are troubled by what he is saying. And now his followers come to believe that he will return. Now the people who followed him are called uh, the Darauzi, or as we say, the Druze. And they are, 
so far out in terms of their theology that most Muslims will not call them Muslim, but they regard themselves as part of, uh, of Islam. Where were they going to go? Up in West Virginia. Up in, uh, think, think of Lebanon as West Virginia. Got it? So they run up into the mountains. So now you've got a Maronite village over here. You've got a Shiite village over here. You've got a Druze village over here. Sometimes they fight each other, but sometimes they unite against their what? Their, their common enemy, the established government that's trying to persecute them. So Lebanon becomes a refugee center. Uh, in the 11th and 12th century, there arrive a people who will be sympathetic to the Maronites. They're Christians. They're coming from Europe. They're called crusaders. They're on big horses covered with armor in a hot Middle Eastern sun. Right, so. Looks a little bit like Don Quixote, perspiring, whatever. But they arrive, although I must confess that Robert Taylor never seemed to perspire in the movie. <laughs> I don't know how they arranged that, but he never seemed to perspire in the movie. Anyway, the Crusaders arrive, and in fact, for a short while, the Maronites in the mountains find they're in charge. The problem is, however, that they're not Catholic, and when the Crusaders discover that they're Christian but not Catholic, they then what? Turn the screws, and they say to them, Either you become Catholic or you get nothing. So some of them became uh, Catholic for a, a while, but it didn't make any difference. The Crusaders are defeated, and in fact the people who throw them out are called the Turks. So now the Turks arrive. The Turks run a pretty good show for about a century, in the 16th century, but then the economy falls apart, the administration falls apart, the politics is reduced to harem politics. And now the Turks can't control all of the territory they've taken. So up in the mountains are these what? Autonomous people, right? And in fact, during the Turkish period in the 17th and 18th century, the group of people who take over because they're the most warlike are the Druzes. In fact, for a period of a century and a half, the Lebanon mountains, what we call Lebanon, is controlled by the Druze. The Druze control it and they rule over the roost, whatever it be. Um, however, uh, it won't last forever because the Crusaders come back in the form of European conquerors in the 19th century. So let me tell you about the the nation that chose Syria as its special area of interest. They were the French. And the French have a notion which we have. Most Americans think that the only language worth speaking is English. And therefore there's no reason to learn any other. You understand. Right. Is there any reason to, when we travel, to learn any other language? We don't. We simply assume that the natives have an obligation to know English. Uh, a similar people that haven't been as successful as the English-speaking people are the French. In the 19th century, the French took an enormous interest in Turkish Syria. The first thing they did was to send missionaries. Um, what happened even before the 19th century was that the French offered their protection to the Maronites against uh, the Turkish government, but with a price tag. The price tag was that they had to become Catholic. So by that time they were so worn down they said yes. And in fact the Maronites became Catholic. Uh, they joined the Catholic Church and they received the protection of the French government so that if the Turks persecuted them the French ambassadors showed up at the Sultan's palace and, uh, and complained, and it worked. So that was stage one. Stage two was they sent missionaries to tell these people what it meant to be Catholic, right? They knew what it meant to be Christian, but what did it mean to be, to be Catholic? Out of it came the establishment of many schools, some universities, 
monasteries, the whole thing. The French focused on the Lebanon mountains. That's where they did most of their work. And in fact, out of it came a fairly uh, well-educated Christian enclave, not only well-educated, but westernized. And then step three, uh, obviously, was the change of the language. Many of the Maronites stopped speaking Arabic, which they had come to speak, and they started speaking French. In fact, French became their favorite language. They did not like to be called Arabs. And that's when they searched for another word. The first word was Syrian, and later on the word would be, uh, would be Lebanese. After all, they weren't of Arab descent. They were descended from the Phoenicians and the Arameans who had lived there before the Arabs had ever gotten there. And now they were protected. Uh, and then the fourth thing that happened, very interesting, was that another Western group arrived. They are called the Americans. In the 19th century, American missionaries were very active. Um, they were not Catholic, they were Protestant. And their focus was a little bit on the Christian population, but they were going to try initially to convert Muslims, which is very hard. But they came and they established in Beirut, which is now growing again. It was big under the Phoenicians and then it had declined during all this trouble. They built a college called the Syrian Protestant College, which later on became the American University, which became one of the major institutions uh, for education and intellectual activity and westernization in the whole Arab world. Students came from all over the Arab world to Beirut to study at the American University. So, so the Americans are there, the French are there, the people are speaking French. The whole thing is being transformed. And then the war comes. World War I. In World War I, as we know from the movie Lawrence of Arabia, the British sent Lawrence to tell the Arabs that if they would rebel against the Turks, they would get Arabia, Syria, and Iraq. So uh, the Arab leaders believed it, and so they joined the rebellion against the Turks. And we all know that because Anthony Quinn, who was an Arab, was fighting Jose Farrar, as you may remember, uh, in the movie, who was, a, do you remember this movie? Who was a Turk, so the whole thing. So th they buy into this thing. Simultaneously, in order to win Jewish support for uh, the British side in uh, World War I, uh, the British, uh, promised southern Syria, which is called Palestine, to the Jews. So now there are two mutually contradictory promises. And third, in secret, the British and French get together in 1915 and sign an agreement between themselves called the Sykes-Picot Agreement, which says that when the war is over, it won't go to either the Arabs or the Jews. It'll go to the British and the French. Of the three, the one that was honored <laughs> was the last. When the war was over, uh, the British got southern Syria, which was called Palestine, and the French got northern Syria. And so in 1920, a French army arrives in the area. Now, the area is filled with all these different groups of people. There are Sunni, there are Shiites, right? There are Maronites. Uh, there are Druze, the whole thing. Um, the overwhelming majority of the people in Syria are Sunni Muslims. So how do the French govern? It's called conquer and divide. You take minorities and make them collaborators. So, what they decided to do uh, was to favor the Christians. 
and to use them as collaborators in their cause. And so out of it, in 1926, came this little state carved out of Syria, which was given to the Christians so that they would be a majority in their own state, which was called Lebanon, and which was presumed uh, to be the most loyal of the colonies to the French. But the French didn't count on Hitler, right? And they didn't count on losing the war because they did lose the war in 1940, do you remember? They lost it and they changed sides. Something you can't bring up in France. <laughs> if you mention that they changed sides in France, you just have to see the look. Well, because it's, no, it, it, it's, it's, it's embarrassing and Pétain enjoyed most likely a majority uh, of the people behind him when that happened. So uh, the whole, the French Empire collapsed. And the next thing you know, Moshe Dayan has arrived in, uh, in Lebanon. And the next thing you know, the British declare that these colonies are independent. And now Lebanon is on its own. The problem is, how do you run this country where there is no, where, where there's no clear majority anymore? Now, the principle they follow, which is still followed in Lebanon, the first principle is don't take a census. Because if you take a census, you'll get the information you don't want. The second principle is the president of Lebanon is always a Maronite Christian. A non-Maronite Christian may not run for the office, according to the Constitution. It would be as though in America it said, the president of the United States must be an Episcopalian. Got it? In the Constitution. Only Episcopalians can run for the presidency. Second, the Prime Minister must always be a Sunni Muslim. So if you're not a Sunni Muslim, do not aspire to become Prime Minister. Now, in this country, we would find that what? Outrageous. But it was the only way they could make this system work. And then the third requirement was that the speaker, the chairman of the legislature, the National Assembly, has to be a Shiite. So every group gets a what? A little piece. Now, the Druze, by this time, uh, are too small in number to qualify, and they're very angry about that because they were accustomed to being in charge in the mountains, but so that's a, a grievance. Three, the three main groups get, uh, get recognized. And then uh, what will follow, obviously, um, is a strategy for Lebanon to work. Let me explain. What makes Switzerland work? <coughs> Switzerland is composed of three nationalities that don't like each other. Germans, which is the majority, the French and the Italians. They don't, they don't like each other. What makes Switzerland work? I'll give you, I'll spell it for you. M-O-N-E-Y. <laughs> Got it? Should it make it work? No! What low values. It works. Switzerland is a prosperous country. And because it's a prosperous country and people were making money for a while, hand over fist, the three groups, what, stuck together because they got more money sticking together than if the French people joined France and the German people joined Germany and the Italians, of, for sure, joined Italy. So the word Swiss doesn't refer to a nationality, it refers to a citizenship. So same thing with Lebanon. The strategy for making Lebanon work was, let's make money. How do we make money? Well, first we will uh, revive the tradition of our Phoenician ancestors, which is what? Trade and commerce, trade and, it's called export, import, import, you know people that? Export, import, import, export for the whole, uh, for the whole Arab world. The second thing, very important, was banking. I am now an Arab sheikh. I have discovered over the past few weeks that I'm sitting over billions of gallons <laughs> of oil. I just, you know, I just, it was under my tent. 
and now I'm making money hand over fist. What do I do with the money? So Beirut now emerged. When I first went to Beirut in 71, I, you, you can't imagine how rich it was. Everything was made out of marble. I mean, you know, the simplest apartment house was made, there was marble. The foyer was marble, the apartment was marble, whatever, it was the whole thing. Enormous amounts of wealth, gorgeous hotels, beautiful bank buildings, they're rising in the Arab world. Nobody deposited their money in Egypt, nobody deposited their money in Algeria. They all came to Beirut. It became the banking center of the Middle East. And the overflow from that was a lot of money. So Lebanon produced, per capita, one of the wealthiest populations in uh, the Arab world. In fact, because of its being a banking center, it turned into a tourist center. So now let me give you an example. You're an Arab sheikh. You don't believe that women should uncover themselves. You want your wife to be chaste, the whole thing. But you want fun. So you then get on a plane and you fly to <laughs> Beirut. When I first went to Beirut in 1971, I was in this hotel. It was a rather nice hotel. And this sheikh comes up to the counter and he orders 12 women <laughs> who were produced almost immediately and they went up the elevator. But the elevator was not even big enough to accommodate. So this was the place, do you understand, where you could loosen up, where you could have fun. It was the great fun city. Lebanon was the pleasure place of the Arab So they found a strategy, got it? Not an army, money, trade, commerce, the whole thing, and uh, the people who benefited from it mainly were the Maronites and the Sunni, but also it poured over a little bit to the Druze and the Shiites, uh, and there it was. This little itsy-bitsy country, like a little Switzerland. It was like a Switzerland of the Middle East. And um, so it was a wonderful strategy because it kept all the groups together, right? If we stick together and keep this country independent, then we'll hang on to our what? To our money. All these people are going to bring their money here, deposit it here. We'll manage it. The Saudis, all the Saudi princes, they put their money in some in American banks. They put it in Beirut initially. However, from the beginning, despite this strategy, there were tensions. So let me mention the tensions. There were two main middle class groups. Uh, one were the Maronite Christians, and the other were the Muslim Sunni. And even when I was there in 1971, there was a lot of tension between them because the Maronites were not interested in Arab nationalism but the Muslim Sunni were, right? So there was, a, there was a kind of tension. There was a tension between the Maronites and the Druze because they were fighting each other always in the mountains, and now the Maronites were much richer and the Druze hadn't quite benefited from the economic miracle as much. There was the tension between the Sunni, who were middle class, and the Shiites, who were dirt poor. And uh, when you went to Beirut, you could see that they had separate neighborhoods, by the way. Uh, I mean, there was the Christian neighborhood on the east side, there was the Muslim neighborhood on the west side, and then there was the Sunni section, and then there was the Shiite section, and there were all these tensions. There was tension between the Maronites and another Christian group. These are the people who have remained faithful to the Orthodox religion. They were called the, or the Greek Orthodox, and they didn't like the Maronites, and uh, often, they would cooperate with the Muslims against the Maronites. And then finally, and applies to what happened just recently, there was internal conflict among the Maronites, who initially were the majority. There were two families among the Maronites who came to hate each other. You know, was it the Algiers and the Newberries? I don't know, the, the Ford and the Christ, whoever it is. They didn't like each other. One were the Jamiles, who were mainly based somewhere near Beirut. And the other were the Frangias, both rich. Lots of land, and 
ultimately there developed between them a blood feud. So intense, I mean, uh, that they couldn't cooperate. So here are the Maronites, they're very vulnerable, their majority is vanishing, and meanwhile their two leading families can't what? Uh, can't get along with each other. And then, in addition, there was the threat of the Syrians. The Syrian government wanted Lebanon back, especially because it was rich. So now Lebanon is small and it doesn't have much of an army. The Syrians have a big army and so now there's all this, uh, this tension. In 1958, when Nasser acquired Syria, you may remember Eisenhower sent troops to Lebanon. Do you remember that? Saying to the Syrians, one, one more, you, you cross that border, one more, one more step, and you'll get it. And last, there were the Palestinians who were dirt poor, I must tell you. Uh, Palestinians are Arabs, and indeed the Maronites are Arabs, and the Sunni are Arabs in Lebanon, the whole thing. But when I was there in 1971, the attitude toward Palestinians was like the attitude of Senator Bilbo of Mississippi toward blacks. If you, if you remember, I mean, uh, they regarded them as riffraff, poor, uh, prone to crime. Well, they were poor. They didn't want them there, the refugees. It's one of the reasons why the PLO rebelled. So despite all the wealth, there were the what? There were these tensions, and then the Civil War came. And when the Civil War came, triggered by the Palestinians rising up with deep resentment against the government of Lebanon that treated them like dirt, they wouldn't give them citizenship. Then the Civil War breaks out, and now the question is who goes on what side? Well, the way it turned out initially was the Palestinians were supported um, by the Sunni, by the Muslims, by the Shiites, and by the Druze. The Maronites were pretty much on their own. And uh, so the war goes on. Meanwhile, it's a perfect time for the Syrians wanting to get Lebanon back to enter Lebanon. They enter in 1976, and after 14 years, they finally subdue the combatants. And they're very unscrupulous. Sometimes they side with the Palestinians against the Maronites. Sometimes they side with the Maronites against the Palestinians. Whatever works. In the end, by 1990, they have established control. And now enters so, Syria. So I've got to tell you a little bit about what happened to Syria after the French left. Well, after the French left, the majority of the people in Syria are Sunni Muslims. Uh, they have, by the way, a fairly uh, successful commercial Okay, what I'm going to do, I'm going to put handcuffs on you, okay? For your protection and mine, okay? Okay. I'm going to put it in front of you so it will be comfortable, okay? All right. Whatever you want to do. Okay. All right. Is that too tight? No. Okay. All right. Okay. You got it? Yep. commercial economy, not as uh, successful as that of Lebanon, but it's fairly successful. However, they have an army that's peculiar. So let me tell you about the Syrian army. It's um, one of the realities in this country that people used to talk about, but never publicly, was 
the children of the white middle class do not wish to go into the army. Right? So who's going to fight? So the people who go into the army are the people who may get an education with the army, they're looking for a job in the army, they're called blacks and Hispanic. Oh. So what if the American army turns into a black Hispanic army? Is that dangerous? Is it? No, uh, do, 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 do. So, in Syria, the children of the Sunni and the Mar uh, whatever Maronites there were, uh, the Christians, small numbers, didn't wish to go into the army. There was a dirt poor, I can call them an Appalachian group, living up in North. Uh, western Syria, they're called the Alawi. And they were like pure West Virginia, got it? The Alawi, they were dirt poor. And they were Shiite. But not only Shiite, they were almost like the Druze. They believed that the cousin of Muhammad, whose name was Ali, was not simply a kind of semi-prophet or messiah. They believed he was God. So they were regarded as like way, way out. But when the French were trying to recruit people for the army in Syria to help them, they recruited them from this population. And when the French left, the army had already established a tradition of using Alawi for the army. Now, the Alawi are a minority in Syria, constituting somewhere around 11% of the population. But the overwhelming majority of the officers in the army were Alawi. And uh, were the Sunni happy about it? The answer is, is no. Uh, now, the Alawi officers, who obviously controlled things, they had the guns, first become excited by Nasser. And in fact, Syria joins Nasser. That doesn't work out. So another party arises in Syria, which will move on to Iraq. You've heard the name. Started in Syria. It's called the Ba'at Party, the party of Saddam Hussein. That did not begin in Iraq. It began in Syria. It was uh, Syrian Arab intellectuals who founded it. The principle of the Ba'at Party was that, in fact, Syria, not Egypt, should be the force that will unite the Arab world. And that the capital of the Arab world will not be Cairo, it will be what? Damascus. It's crazy. But they take control. Uh, however, they receive a reversal. In 1967, they fight the Israelis in the Six-Day War, and they lose an important slice of Syria called the Golan Heights which brings down the leader of the government. But the Alawi just find another person. His name, Assad, A-S-S-A-D. He now moves in in 1971, that's when I visited uh, Damascus, and he takes over Syria. And he has a program. Let me give you. If, if the Lebanese program was trade, commerce, banking, and tourism. The program of Assad in Syria was not the same. His strategy was the following. Strong army, make sure that all the officers are Alawi. Strategy two, get weapons. How? Well, the Americans, uh, favor the Lebanese and the Israelis, so we will turn to the what? The Soviet Union. So now the Russians arrive. When I was there, the Russians were pouring into Damascus. They're all over the place. Get weapons from the Soviet Union. Three, if the Alawi are to stay in power, keep the Sunni down. A few years after he came to power, the Sunni Muslims uh, who were fundamentalist, 
rose up in a rebellion against the government in a city called Hama. What he then did, and I mean, I still remember the, the pictures, he sent his army. They surrounded the city and they bombarded the city and over 10,000 people were killed. And from that point on, there was no what? Uh, no rebellion. Finish it off, everybody is content. The fourth thing he does, because he wants to control the economy, influenced by the Soviet Union, unlike Lebanon, which is living on capitalism, he chooses socialism. So he wrecks the whole commercial sector, he nationalizes everything, but now everything is under the what? The control of Assad and the army, and the way he mobilizes people who complain about the economy, he says, we're in a fight with America and the Jews. So Assad establishes a very repressive government. He and Saddam Hussein belong to the same political party, but they can't cooperate. They can't cooperate because Saddam Hussein is a Sunni <laughs> and Mr. Assad is a Shiite. So they proceed to hate each other. Saddam Hussein says, I'm going to make Baghdad the capital of the Arab world. And Mr. Assad says, I'm going to make Damascus the capital of the Arab world. Meanwhile, in order to justify all this military preparation, since he can't attack the Israelis who are too powerful, the one thing he has is, I, 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 get back Lebanon. Get back Lebanon. So when the Civil War starts in Lebanon, Mr. Assad uh, now sends his army in and the Syrians take over. So from 1990 until 2005, Lebanon has lived under the occupation of the Syrians. They have basically, or were basically, re-annexed. What was it like? Well, very simple. There were Syrian soldiers all over Lebanon. All over Lebanon. The second thing was Mr. Assad favored an alliance. As the Soviet Union collapsed, who was he going to turn to? His ally became Ayatollah Khomeini and Iran. And in fact, um, Khomeini had died, but his Khamenei was now in power. So now there's this established relationship with uh, Iran. Iran sends terrorists into Lebanon in order to harass the Israelis. The name of this organization which is the party of God, is called Hezbollah. And now they organize all kinds of terrorist camps and whatever uh, on the Israeli, uh, near the Israeli army, whatever it be. I, so, and in fact, Assad is financing it. Um, in fact, he allows Syria to become a major center for Arab terrorists. Many of the groups that were expelled from other parts of the Arab world find hospitality in Damascus. And now that Lebanon is in the hands of Syria, they're in what? They're in Lebanon as well. The third thing he does is, since he has massive unemployment in Syria, he ships into Lebanon thousands and thousands of Syrian workers who take jobs away from the, the Lebanese, the fourth thing, and this is very interesting, was a, a success story for him just before he died. Um, he had a very weak heart, and in fact, there were episodes, the, was he going to survive, was he not going to survive? He ultimately capitulated in 2000. But in the early part of 2000, the Prime Minister of Israel was a man called Ehud Barak. He tried to make peace with Yasser Arafat and it failed. 
Barack was looking for a dramatic thing to do to uh, boost his, uh, his prestige. Uh, when the Civil War was over in Lebanon, Israel had retained a little section of South Lebanon as a buffer so that the Lebanese army wouldn't be right on the border. Uh, and Barak decides to evacuate it. And in fact, you may remember in the year 2000, uh, in May of 2000, the, the Israeli army withdraws completely and fully from southern Lebanon. The Hezbollah moves south to the, to the border and it's regarded uh, as a great victory uh, for Assad. Now, the presence of the Syrians with their ideology in Lebanon triggers enormous resentment. First of all, the economy can't work with their continuous control. The rebuilding process uh, can't move forward at the pace it needs to because the Syrians are socialists and they have all these bureaucratic regulations and the Syrian army is everywhere. So, there now develops, and this is the surprise. Historically, the Christians and Muslims never cooperated. They were enemies in Lebanon. But now, the Maronite Christians discover that the Sunni Muslims, who are very middle class, hate the Syrians, in particular since the army is Alawi, Shiite, and they discover that the Druze, whom they had fought for centuries, also don't like the Syrians. So the principle is the enemy of my enemy is my friend. And all of a sudden, a resistance movement starts. It's, it starts up uh, somewhere around uh, 1998, two years before the Israeli withdrawal, it's led by an interesting man, a multi-millionaire construction man called Rafiq Hariri. He's a Sunni Muslim and he brings together the Maronites, he brings together the um, Sunni Muslims, he brings together the Druze under their leader Walid Jumblat, and they all come together and they say, the Syrians out. Well, the Syrians aren't prepared to leave, except now something happens. In 2003, the American army seizes Iraq and removes Saddam Hussein. And now Syria, there's no Soviet Union to turn to, is surrounded by enemies. Israel to the south, Iraq to the east because the Americans have it, and to the north is a country that doesn't like them, Turkey. So now the American government applies pressure on Syria, pull out of Lebanon, or we may even invade you. So with this pressure, the opposition in Lebanon now is emboldened, and then comes the trigger. The trigger happened in September of 2004. In September of 2004, the Syrian government will not allow a free election of a Maronite president. The president has to be Maronite. They insist that their collaborator, who has been president for years, must continue. His name is Emil Lahoud. And they force the legislature to approve his election. And that triggers a major provocation. And in fact, Rafiq Hariri now organizes a group. They come out into the streets. They begin to demonstrate. They feel they have the support of the American government. And then in March, the Syrians foolishly blow up Rafiq Hariri. By that time, Syria has a new president. The old man died from his heart condition. He is replaced by his son, the ophthalmologist. 
who is drafted for the job and is brought back from London. His name is Bashar, and he's not quite sure what to do. He tries to look tough. You see his picture goes like this. <laughs> he's not his father. So Bashar, obviously, had agreed to blowing up Hariri, which was the dumbest thing to do, because what it did was it now mobilizes, what, hundreds of thousands of people out in the streets screaming, get out of Lebanon, get out of Lebanon, and the crowds aren't a Christian crowd or, or a Muslim crowd, the crowd is a mixture, you got it? For the first time, it's a mixture of of Christians and Muslims and Druze, and they're all there screaming, wearing orange like the Ukrainians. And <laughs> I remember the, the TV shots were absolutely overwhelming. Is this a new day for Lebanon? Will the Syrians withdraw? And if they do, what does it mean for Lebanon, and what does it mean for the Middle East, and what does it mean for Israel, and whatever else it is? If you want to find out, come back in five minutes. But I must say, there are two things that happened uh, that were positive. One, Muammar Gaddafi of Libya changed sides. That was back in 2003. And the second is that Syria withdrew from Lebanon. And now the Syrians are out of Lebanon. Does that mean they don't have agents in their police? All right. Spies. All right. But the troops are gone. Now, Syria was regarded as one of the most supportive states of terrorism in the Muslim world. Its government was not fundamentalist, it was secular, but they supported fundamentalists and they supported both secular and fundamentalist terrorism. So this was an enormous reversal, uh, and the prestige of the regime has suffered. Mr. Ophthalmologist is not as strong as his, uh, his father, and whether he can survive is certainly problematic. Uh, following the withdrawal of the Syrians, an election was held. It was held in four elections. There were four areas of Lebanon where the election was held, but they weren't held on the same day. The first election was held in Beirut. Now, what, what was very interesting was that the people who wanted the Syrians out were three groups, the Maronites, the Sunni, Muslims, strange alliance that never happened before, Christians and Muslims on the same side, and the Druze, because the, and the Maronites and the Druze have been killing each other for centuries. Three groups. Uh, because the Christians don't have a majority anymore. So, uh, however, there were people in Lebanon who didn't want the Syrians to leave. One of them were the Shiites, who hated the Sunni and hated the Maronites. They didn't want them to leave, and who had received benefits from the Syrians. Their chief organization, which had turned into a political party, was the sponsor of terrorism called Hezbollah. So the question was, um, does the resistance group have a majority or no? In the first election held in Beirut, uh, the son of the assassinated man, Sa'ad Hariri, won overwhelmingly. So that looked very good. There are 128 seats in the, uh, in the Lebanese parliament. Some of them are designated according to religious group. But overwhelmingly, almost everybody elected was on the resistance side. Then the second election was held in the south where the Shiites are dominant, in Hezbollah. And it overwhelmingly went against the resistance. Oh. Does that mean that the new government would welcome the Syrians back? 
The third election was held in the middle. And it was generally assumed so that since there were so many Maronites and Sunni there, that it would overwhelmingly go for the resistance and would guarantee uh, an obvious majority, but a surprise now occurred. A former Christian general, the head of the Lebanese army, who had fled before the Syrians returned, and he offered himself up as basically a candidate for prime minister, an alternative to Sa'ad Hariri. And um, he did something very interesting. There are two families that hate each other among the Maronites, the Jamiles and the Frangia. So the Jamile group supported the resistance. And the general, who was a Christian, receive support from the Frangia faction, and they so hate their Maronite brothers in the Jamile faction that they basically made a deal with the Syrians. So, in election three, the results are very iffy. It's not clear the resistance will, will win. But then in the far north, where there are no Maronites but only Sunni, the election was held and it went overwhelmingly for the resistance. In the end, out of the 128, the majority was not as great as the resistance thought it would be. It was 72 out of 128. You need 65 to what? Uh, control, and it's seven more. It's not overwhelming, but now a new government is in, uh, in place and their main job now is to get rid of the president that was forced on them by the by the Syrians. So uh, the election turned out favorably uh, for the resistance, not as favorably as they had wanted. So let's look at Lebanon right now, because the election just took place in June. Lebanon is divided between two groups. One group is glad the Syrians are gone, and the other group, the Shiites in particular, uh, who always bore resentment against the richer Sunni and Maronites. They want the Syrians back. So it, it's not all the Lebanese want the Syrians out. Plus, the government of Syria is Shiite, isn't it? The second is uh, the, the Hezbollah, which is the party of the Shiites, uh, is now tamer than it was. At one time it was a terrorist organization. It's turned into a political party. Maybe that's a, a pattern for Hamas among the Palestinians. And now, at one time it said the country has to be a Muslim country. Now, because it wishes to uh, be part of the democratic process, it says, no, 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 no. Lebanon can be Muslim, Christian, whatever, whatever else it is. So uh, the old terrorist face uh, has been softened, and that certainly is, uh, is positive. The Maronites are still divided between the Jamal faction and the what? The Frangia faction. I mean, I want to tell you about feuds. I don't know whether you ever, have ever seen family feuds or anything. Mm -hmm. it's, so, it's so easy to start them. It's so difficult to, no, no, uh, to stop them or to end them. I mean, they, they, they have a life all their own. You can't, you can't terminate them. I mean, they, 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 they have an energy all, um, all their own. What is most interesting for the new Lebanon is that Muslims and Christians and Druze have come together in an alliance. Never before. Maronites, Sunni, and Druze in an alliance for a democratic state against uh, the Syrians. And uh, that's one of the most positive things that has happened because if it was Christians against Muslims, the Christians would never have a what? They wouldn't have a chance. And now what we have are elements of the Muslim population who are strongly in favor of what we call democratic reform. Uh, the president, Emil Lahoud, who is the Christian collaborator, is very vulnerable because the new government is determined 
uh, to eliminate him, and the Syrians no longer have an army in Lebanon to keep him in power. The economy has been steadily improving in Lebanon. It's not back to where it was. I want to tell you that while, during the Civil War, the Arab rich took their money and deposited it elsewhere. Switzerland, <laughs> America, London, whatever else it is. Uh, it was a great disaster for Beirut. They're trying to rebuild the banking industry, and they're trying to rebuild the export-import. Uh, Beirut will never again be what it was uh, at that time. One of the interesting things is, for Israel, one of the chief enemies of Israel is Syria that wants the Golan Heights back. Lebanon now doesn't have a grievance. Southern Lebanon, which was occupied by the Israeli army, has been what? Uh, has received back the, uh, the territory. Um, obviously, and this is very interesting, there is a natural alliance between the Christians of Lebanon and the Jews of Israel because they share a common agenda. They feel very vulnerable. And it's quite possible that if the withdrawal from Gaza is followed by other withdrawals in the West Bank, that it will be possible for a Lebanese government to establish a much friendlier uh, relationship. While the Syrians were in control, it was not possible. But with the Syrians gone, uh, and with American support, it's possible that uh, a peace that was achieved with Egypt and with Jordan, and which is now being worked out with the Palestinians to some degree, uh, might be possible uh, with Lebanon. One of the realities is that the Syrians are waiting to come back. Got it? I mean, it was deeply humiliating to have to withdraw. Uh, Bashar Assad knows that his prestige has been compromised by that withdrawal. So what does the future hold? So let me try to draw the scenario for Lebanon. The first is that Lebanon will increasingly turn to the United States of America for support. Um, it will feel that uh, it needs it against the forces in the Muslim world, especially in Syria, which wish uh, to retake it, it most likely will establish better relations with the Israelis. Not possible over the last 15 years while the Syrians were in control. The third thing is they most likely will take a census. <laughs> See, for the Christians now, it's less dangerous because they have developed an alliance with uh, the Sunni Muslims and the Druze. And what they will have to do is change the Constitution. A state in which the presidency is guaranteed to a Christian, the prime ministership to a Muslim, uh, Sunni, and the uh, chair of the legislature is guaranteed to a Shiite Muslim is uh, now intolerable. What they need is a state in which uh, a real uh, open democracy is possible, and quite frankly, I think that alliance may make it uh, possible. And the last is that the forced withdrawal of the Syrians from Lebanon may lead ultimately to the overthrow of Bashar Assad in Syria. Now, things looked better about eight months ago. Uh, the Americans seem to have greater control of Iraq. Uh, they were working on the Syrian border because many, many of the terrorists who enter Iraq uh, to wreak havoc make their way from Syria, which allows them to do so, although the government of Syria denies it. Uh, but I must say that in Syria now, uh, the government has been humiliated. The Sunni Muslims hate the Shiite government. 
the credibility of the government is down, the economy is absolutely rotten, and it's quite possible that, that if there were demonstrations in Lebanon, there could also be demonstrations in Damascus which could ultimately not be put down simply by calling on the Alawi army. Uh, Syria is now vulnerable. So what has happened over the last year is a major change. Um, I never imagined that Syria would withdraw from Lebanon. Just never. Um, and now I see the possibility even of an overthrow of the Syrian regime. But all of that will be dependent on what happens in Iraq. If Iraq turns into mayhem, then uh, the power of Syria will be enhanced, the threat to Lebanon will resume. So to a large degree, all the countries of the Middle East are, uh, are tied, uh, tied together. The dream for Israel, as, as it is the dream for Lebanon, is to be a small country making money on, inter <laughs> on international commerce because there's the brain power, the willpower, the tradition, the whole thing. Israel and Lebanon share uh, many characteristics. The question is whether the politics of the Middle East will allow that to happen. All I can say is, um, because of the events that have taken place over the last few months, the possibility that that may be true is the greater. And thank you all very, very much. They sing in Yiddish. So it, it, it's like a, a bunch of us would, would learn Chippewa. So, no, no, no. So, no, no, no. We're all standing out in the middle of Birmingham singing Chippewa, Chippewa. So, I mean, what, what are we, the whole thing is, it's absurd. So now there's, there are no Jews, but there's this what? This little piece of Jewish culture. They, they, I cannot tell you how they fall in love with it. If you announce a klezmer workshop, you will get people from all over Poland traveling long distances to come and dress up looking like Hasidic Jews, do you understand, <laughs> singing in Yiddish. All right. Now, uh, as a result of what I call this change with the Communist Party, no, no, it's called the Democratic Alliance, forgive me, okay, is uh, there are anxieties. One are the farmers. 
One of the reasons they want to join Europe is they're hoping that they'll get subsidies just like the French. Which, by the way, isn't what they need. What they really need to do is to get rid of many of the small plots and turn them into what? Huger operations because corporate farming is where, do you understand, is where it is, it's, it's how, uh, how you do it. There's the cost of labor thing. The, the more prosperous the poles become, the higher the what? Cost of labor. So you stop being Mexico. <laughs> Once you stop being Mexico, then people are going to go to the next country that has what? Uh, cheap labor, but, how, but you want to improve your what? Your standard of living, so that's always the, uh, the problem. There's the anxiety about the Germans. I mean, there really is. We've got to deal with them. And in order to deal with them, they're saying, well, we need compensation, and we've got all these, there are millions of them who are the children of these refugees who were driven out of Eastern Germany, which is now Western Poland, and they would like a little recognition and compensation. So Poland needs allies. Uh, the Germans, not reliable. The French, not reliable. For the Poles, in their mind, the liberators of their world were the Americans. And they've got all these relatives in uh, Chicago, no, 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 in, uh, in America. And um, so the United States of America is now the what? The ally. So, so their, their anxiety uh, is handled by the American alliance, which infuriates the French and infuriates the Germans. So what does it all mean? By the way, there was a short hiatus where Kwasniewski lost power. There was a period of time between 1997 and 1999 when the old Solidarity crew came back, but don't worry, that crew couldn't do anything. So they, and by 1999, it's over. The Kwasniewski group is back. Mr. Gorgeous, Miss Gorgeous, the whole thing. And, um, and he's sort of perfect because his communist background makes him secular in a way that cheeky Poles want to be. Because although it, you can't denounce the church, even when the Pope showed up, he showed up, and you know, the whole thing, the routine, but uh, he is willing to offer criticism. And that's a, that, I want to tell you, in Poland, that is an enormous change. Any kind of negative criticism of the church is a, uh, it's a change, and it all goes along with what we call the economic transformation of Poland. So what are the implications for the future? Well, there most likely will be, there are lots of losers in Poland. By losers, I mean people who don't win in the economic game. Most of them are farmers. They're not very happy, and you can see them out in the countryside, and they're poor. They don't participate in the prosperity, and there are lots of unemployed people still in the, in the cities, but there's, there'll be more prosperity because this economy is what? Moving forward, there's a good work ethic, and there is determination and ambition, and they've, uh, they haven't become jaded yet with consumerism. Right. Right. Uh, the second is their power will increase because they will be part of Europe. And they're not a small thing like Slovakia, whatever. They are a nation of 40 million people whose economy is improving. So the French and the Germans are going to have to pay attention to the Poles. There's going to be more secularism because the consequence of more consumer culture is not that people become hostile to religion. It's that they just don't, they just don't do it. Uh, the fourth is going to be more European because now that they've joined Europe, Poles can move anywhere in Europe, do you understand? They can go to Ireland, they can go to England, they can go to France, they can go to, you, you can live anywhere you want. You don't have to even show your passport at the, the border. It might even be the case that a few <laughs> foreigners will move the other way, will want to go work in, um, work in Poland. Poland sees itself, by the way, as on the defense border against the Easterners. The Easterners are the Russians. Oh. 
And Belarus, the leader of Belarus, Lukashenko, is pro-Russian, anti-Polish. The Ukraine now is going to have an election. It's quite possible that a pro-Russian, what I would call anti-West candidate, will win, in which case this will be the line. The European, the eastern boundary, uh, you want, uh, stretching from Estonia all the way down to Romania. And last, the United States of America looking for a, a strategy for controlling the Europeans will increasingly turn to Poland as a what? As a country that they can use uh, in Europe as a kind of counterforce all right, to the, the French uh, and the Germans if they maintain their present policy. It's almost unbelievable, given our view of what Poland was, it's now emerging as a power in Europe. So whatever old images you had, you got it? <coughs> With little old peasants and little old shtetlach, whatever they are, drop it. It's, you know, it's changing, absolutely changing, and it's part of what I call the transformation brought about by this incredible global economy, which has bad consequences, but it also has some absolutely, what, wonderful consequences, and they all go together, and thank you all for coming this morning. Thank you.